Like, we don't know why. We really don't. I mean, this thing, it made a ton of noise and we really don't know why. Well, hello again, everybody. Mike here with Hardware Canucks again, and I have a little bit of a confession to make. Every single time I do a roundup, it doesn't matter if it's rounding up fans, coolers, whatever else it might be, the one thing, the one thing that I'm always waiting for the most is the thing that comes in right after the roundup is done. And in this case, it is the Alpenfin Black Ridge. Right after that ultra low profile cooler roundup was done, it ended up showing up. But I'm actually happy that it ended up showing up a little bit late because just lumping it into a general roundup where a couple of the things that it can do are glossed over, well, that would do this thing such a disservice. So in this video, what I wanted to do is I wanted to go in deep into everything about this cooler. That includes general performance, fan swaps, a bunch of fitment issues, a couple of mods you can do to it, and so many other things. But the first thing that I need to talk about is availability of this in North America, because for whatever reason, Alpenfin has decided not to have any distribution whatsoever within North America. So folks like me, folks south of the border, we have to import this from Europe or somewhere else overseas. And that imparts a bunch of other costs onto it. So there's foreign exchange costs, there's additional shipping costs, customs charges, all these other things. And that makes nailing down the actual price for the Black Ridge a little bit tough over here in the new world. I mean, I've seen it go for anywhere from 77 bucks all the way up to 120 Canadian or from 60 to 100 bucks south of the border. But for the rest of the world where you can actually find it from first party retailers locally, you're probably looking at around 40 British pounds or 70 Australian dollars. So it ain't cheap by any stretch of the imagination, but is the Black Ridge worth it? Well we're gonna see but I do know what's worth your time and that's watching this ad spot for the new NZXT H1. The new H1 from NZXT is the perfect hassle-free ITX experience with lots of power, pre-routed cables, a capable 140mm all-in-one cooler with its own fan controller and massively compact GPU chamber that is actively cooled for them good temps. The H1 V2, check it out below. Anyways at this point in time I'm sure you're wondering what is the hype all about when it comes to this guy, the Black Ridge? And a lot of that has to do with its heritage within the ITX market. Basically, this was originally conceived as a partnership between Dan Cases and Alpenfin in order to create a cooler for the A4 case for people who just didn't want an AIO. That means it's 47 millimeters high, which doesn't make it the shortest heatsink around, and it uses a single 92 millimeter by 15 millimeter fan to push air through the fin array instead of pushing it down. While this layout isn't the most optimal for raw processor temperatures, it does do one important thing. Instead of blasting the CPU's hot air into the case, it gets exhausted straight away, provided of of course there's ventilation above the cooler. That's critical in the confined spaces found in ITX cases where heat tends to build up so much. But other than that, the Black Ridge is exceedingly well built and installation, that's pretty straightforward too. It goes down the process that pretty much all the other ITX coolers do these days. Now, I'm gonna have the cameraman come in just to talk about that very quickly. So the first thing that you're gonna have to do is pick the right brackets for your socket type. Then you're going to apply the cooler, balance it, this is pretty nuts, yes I know. And then basically apply your four screws from the back. Now you are going to recognize something here very, very quickly and that's the fact. It's an expensive cooler, it's a higher end cooler, but it does not come with a back plate. All you get is the screws and little spacers. That's a huge shame here. But other than that, there are a couple of things that I wanna talk about when it comes to compatibility with most motherboards on the market. And to do that, I'm gonna use this B550i with the AM4 socket. First of all, look, you can't install a GPU into the motherboard itself since the slot is blocked by the Black Ridge. You'll need to use a riser cable unless your layout allows you to flip the whole cooler in the other direction. And even then, a traditional riser cable gets really, really close. You also have to take into account that the heatsink overhangs the memory slots and the amount of space left is only about 33 millimeters. So that means you have to use lower profile modules. The other thing, guys, the fun doesn't stop there, especially if you have a motherboard like this that's built up a little bit more vertically. So here the fan almost comes into contact with the VRM heatsinks and it's smashed right into the M.2 heatsink between the PCIe slot and the CPU socket. The only way to install it was to remove the heatsink and run the SSD bare. But if you do run into one of those installation problems, there are some ways around it, and Alpenfin has actually thought of those. 
First of all, they ship this cooler with two sets of 120 millimeter fan brackets. That means that you can just slap on one of these things, a standard 120 millimeter fan, and avoid a lot of those problems that you might encounter during installation. But those fan configurations are actually something I wanted to talk about a little bit deeper here. Other than the stock config, you can place a thin 120 millimeter fan in the place of the original 92 millimeter one. But you need to take this into account, guys. It makes compatibility even more challenging since you'd need to use VLP or very low profile memory that looks something like this. So it's not a great option unless you're using the Black Ridge in a server or something that needs ECC. Another option is to take that thin 120 millimeter fan and just places it on top of the cooler, pushing air downwards and removing the original fan altogether. Sure, that increases the height to 62 millimeters, but you get better clearance below and better performance too that I'm gonna talk about in a bit. There's another option of simply adding a 120 millimeter fan alongside the 92 millimeter, but Alpenfin actually doesn't recommend that at all. Supposedly dual configs with different size fans tend to cause turbulence within the heatsink, which would then lead to a lot higher noise and no better temperatures. The last option is probably what's gonna be easiest for a lot of you guys. It's to mount a standard height fan on the top in a push config. Alpenfin calls this an overclock layout, but you need to remember this pushes the height of the cooler to 72 millimeters. And that's, in my opinion, outside of the low profile market. And that's pretty much your high level overview about what the Black Ridge offers. But a lot of the talk about this thing centers around how well it performs against other similar coolers. And we just did that ultra low profile roundup, so we have more than enough data to see if this is worth it. Now, I know that a lot of you guys have been asking for this, so here's fan speed percentages with their respective decibel readings that you're going to see throughout all of the testing. And let's get on to that testing, starting with 65 watts right away. And this thing puts out some ridiculously good numbers right out of the gate. It beats the Noctua L9A and even the super expensive Cryorig C7. The only thing that matches it is the Thermalrite AXP90R that's about the same height and is typically priced quite a bit lower too if you're living in North America. So you need to take that into account as we go through these charts. And narrowing that down to a quiet 38 decibels, it's pretty clear that at least some of the Black Ridge's height is completely justified. It's just a really, really good cooler for lower wattage processors. But what happens when we pump things up to 95 watts? And you have to remember, in the last roundup, a lot of these low profile coolers completely failed from front to back at 95 watts. And the Black Ridge, yeah, it struggles too here a bit by failing at 36, 37, and 38 decibels. But above that, its thermal mass and a higher fan speed start dropping temperatures super fast until it's beating some of the very best coolers out there. I mean, this thing matches the AXP90R and the L9 series at 39 decibels. Now I know everybody's looking at these charts and saying, look, Mike, I do not pound my system like a lazy donkey all day, every day with a high core workload. What you guys are probably doing on it is either light workloads or gaming. So what I wanted to do is include a couple of gaming temperature results here where the GPU is basically doing what it does. It's pumping hot air into the case. So all of these coolers actually have to deal with that additional heat load. And this is where updraft coolers tend to struggle a bit since preheated air is being passed through the cooler instead of fresh air. That leads to the Black Ridge falling behind in comparison to some of the more traditional downdraft style coolers like the Thermalrite and Noctua. It even struggles to beat the much, much cheaper IS40X here. You can really see how that affects things around the 38 decibel level. Here, the Black Ridge is a solid middle of the pack performer that still gets good results, but it does struggle to overcome the higher ambient case temperatures when gaming. But is there a way using your stock configuration in order to overcome that? I was wondering what would happen if you simply flip over that 92 millimeter fan so it's actually potentially intaking cool air from above the cooler instead of chewing down on all that hot air while gaming within the case. That, it ended up being a really, really interesting little test because listen to this at 50% and 100% fan speed.
Well, it's always nice to add a couple of little tests into these reviews, but sometimes they fail, sometimes they pass. This was definitely a fail. But speaking of configurations, one of them that might be worthwhile is replacing the stock fan with this little guy. Noctua's famous NF-A9 by 14 fan. Let's check out what the results are with this thing installed in the stock configuration. And right away, we're seeing a good two to three degree drop in temperatures. And that puts the Black Ridge at a point that's way better than pretty much anything else the competition has to offer. Things get even better at higher wattages where the additional airflow provided by that Noctua fan is put to amazing use. I mean, sure, it doesn't have as much top end performance, but there's now a much better balance between temperatures and noise. Even in gaming, this simple change has made the Black Ridge into a whole other cooler. It's suddenly the best low pro profile heatsink I've ever tested, period. Now the fun, no, it does not end there. I wanted to hit this thing with a little bit more testing, turn the dial to 11 a little bit. And yeah, sure, the Noctua, it performed very, very well. But what happens when we hit this thing with 120 millimeter fans? So for that, I chose two of them. One of them is this guy. This is the Nidec Gentle Typhoon. The other one is a little bit thinner. This is a standard 15 millimeter high Scythe Case Flex. And the story here is pretty straightforward. Adding a 120 millimeter fan on top of the 92 millimeter stock one doesn't do all that much at all. But take away that stock fan and the results actually become even more impressive. I mean, sure, you give away some of the Black Ridge's super compact height, but you do get some crazy good performance by just adding a thin, low speed fan like the Scythe Flex. The interesting thing here is that stepping up to a regular fan actually doesn't do that much to further increase cooling performance. And I guess this brings us to the end of the journey and I set out with one simple question. Is the Black Ridge worthy of its hype? And I would say absolutely, positively. It's not even the fact that it offers good performance out of the box. It's the fact that it's so adaptable with all sorts of different fan configurations so you can customize it for your own system if you're willing to pay the additional cost. And that cost is really what's going to put a damper on this cooler for a lot of people, specifically here within the North American market. If you're looking at paying 70, 80, $100 in some cases for this thing, there are a lot better options out there, like the L9 series or the AXP90 series from Thermalright. If you're willing to pay the price for it, then this should be your go-to ultra low profile cooler. But anyways, other than that, I am so happy I got this thing in. I'm Mike with Hardware Canucks, and I will see you in the next one. Robert. But what happens if we step it up even more? What has just turned off? Cut. <laughs>